All right, welcome everyone. This is the Book Talk Nation chat with Chris Kresser and Michelle Tam. So as you'll see, this works a little bit like an author event in a bookstore. Chris and Michelle are going to talk about their, their new books, um, Nom Nom Paleo and Your Personal Paleo Code. If you don't have those books, you haven't ordered them, you can do so right here on this page. Um, right next to the video window, you'll see where you can order the signed and personalized books. So they'll be signing and personalizing those in your name. You can order them right here on this page or at booktalknation.com. And then their local indie bookstores, Kepler's, and a great good place for books will ship those right to your door. Now, those sales will shut tomorrow night, so they will close down tomorrow night. So if you'd like that signed personalized copy, you're going to want to make sure that you get it in by then. Um, you'll also see underneath this video window, there's a chat window. In that chat box, you can type your questions for Chris and for Michelle, and in about 20 minutes, we'll start answering those questions. So we'll pull some questions right there from the live chat. We'll also pull some questions that you submitted ahead of time when you RSVP to the event. And we will do that in about 20 minutes. Until then, I'm going to turn it over to Karen Holt, who is our interviewer tonight. Karen is a freelance uh, writer and editor who um, reviews books for O the Oprah Magazine, Parade, and other publications. So welcome, Karen. Welcome, Chris. And welcome, Michelle. And I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Jennifer. Well, Chris Kessler, Kessler is a practitioner of integrative and functional medicine and cre creator of the highly respected natural health site, chriscresser.com. His new book, based on more than 10 years of research and work with clinical patients, is Your Personal Paleo Code. You can see this. Uh, Michelle Tam is the creator of the award-winning, wildly popular Nom Nom Paleo blog, which I will have her explain that name in a minute, uh, and the best-selling app of the same name. Now, her new, her new uh, book, new cookbook, Nom Nom Paleo, is filled with recipes, gorgeous photographs, and as a bonus, cartoons. So, something you don't see every, in every cookbook. So, welcome, Chris and Michelle, and thank you for taking the time to talk with us. Thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. So I just want to throw out something at the beginning uh, for people who are not familiar with what the paleo diet is. I mean, I know that it is based on how people ate back in the Paleolithic or Stone Age. And my question to start with is, why is that superior? I mean, they, they ate that way because they didn't have a choice, right? I mean, they, they didn't have farms. They didn't have supermarkets. So why is that way of eating better than what has evolved. Michelle, would you like me to answer this? <laughs> yes. I will do all the cooking questions and the easy questions. <laughs> right. Well, uh, all organisms are adapted to survive and thrive in a particular environment. So in other words, our physiology and anatomy become adapted to a particular environment and that's true not only for human beings, but any other animal or organism in nature. And that evolution happens over many hundreds of thousands or even millions of years. And so uh, each species will then have a, a species appropriate diet. And in fact, in zoos, uh, when animals become sick, the first thing they do to get them healthy again, uh, as another paleo author, John Durant, had talked about in his recent book, is put them back on their species-appropriate diet. In other words, the diet that they would eat in the, in the wild. And uh, inevitably, that does actually return them to health. And so, as humans, we also have a species-appropriate diet, one that we evolved on over many millions of years of hominid evolution. And when humans follow that diet, they're naturally lean and fit and virtually free of chronic inflammatory disease. And that was true for our Paleolithic ancestors, and it, it's also true for contemporary hunter-gatherers that have been studied. Um, most people have the idea that our Paleo ancestors all died when they were 30 years old. That's a common uh, criticism you often hear about the Paleo diet. and the, it is true that our ancestors had shorter average lifespans than we have today, but that is largely because of challenges they faced then that we don't face today, at least most of the people watching the, the Hangout right now. Uh, for, for example, they lived outdoors, so they could be attacked by a predator or die from exposure to the cold. They lived in a very violent world with lots of tribal warfare so that they could be killed. 
Um, they could die from something as simple as a, an infected wound because they had no medical care and they had very high rates of infant mortality due to that lack of medical care. But it turns out that more recent studies of contemporary hunter-gatherers found that even if they had access to the most basic rudimentary health care, like having to walk 10 miles to the nearest health clinic, they lived lifespans that were equivalent to our own today. Uh, so they live well into their 70s, but the difference is they reach those ages without getting any of the inflammatory diseases that we consider to be normal today, like obesity, diabetes, heart disease, autoimmune disease, allergies, and asthma. So that's the essential argument behind why you want to follow a, a diet that's not necessarily exactly what our ancestors ate, but that is based on those principles. Well, Michelle, I know that you came to paleo not necessarily uh, you know, through a lot of scientific research, but through a personal experience of, of loving food but wanting to feel better. Can you talk about sort of your evolution to paleo? So I was really resistant to going paleo. Um, my husband did it first. Um, I've been a lifelong foodie and gastro tourist. Like I will travel the world to try like a certain dish, and um, like I joke about it, but it's totally true. Like when we went to Florence, my husband would have to drag me to like go see the galleries and see all the you know, the stuff you're supposed to see in Florence, and I, in turn, would drag him to all the places that I wanted to eat. Um, and I, I did have a nutrition food science major from the 90s, but what I was taught was to eat, like, low fat, low saturated fat, um, high carb, almost vegetarian, because red meat is so bad for you. So that was just ingrained in my head. And... But I've always loved food, and growing up in the Bay Area, um, you know, you're just surrounded by fantastic food, and my mother was a fantastic cook. Um, and so when my husband decided to go paleo, he kind of did it just to, because he's just a dabbler, and he's kind of interested in trying out new things, and so he started eating paleo, and his, you know, he suddenly got a six pack and he had all this energy and you know he started doing CrossFit and was getting strong and he was eating all this food that I wanted to eat but I you know I banned it because it was supposed to be bad for me because he, he was eating meat and you know vegetables and eating healthy fats but to me I was like you are just a heart attack waiting to happen um, and so I was super resistant, and I tried to sabotage him probably for months. Um, and then one day, we were, our family was on this um, Alaskan cruise together, and we were at the buffet line, and there was this wall of bread. I mean, there literally, literally was like this wall of bread um, at the buffet line, and there was a person in front of me in a scooter with one of those oxygen tanks just piling his plate with all of this, you know, like low sugar, whole wheat pastries, and then he put on some like sugar-free maple syrup. And at that moment, like a switch flipped, and I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna try it. I'm right here now. I'm gonna just try to go paleo on an Alaskan cruise, and I did it, and I felt so great that I haven't looked back. And I'm kind of like this all or nothing kind of person. Like I'll be resistant, 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 and then boom, if something works, I become this crazy evangelist for it. <laughs> well, Chris, can you tell your story? Because I know that you spent a lot of years and struggled with a lot of health problems before you discovered paleo. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so <clears throat> in my early 20s, I took off for a around the world trip. Uh, and I was in Indonesia doing some surfing, and I, I got the classic tropical illness. I was vomiting, diarrhea, delirious, um, don't really even remember much of what happened for those few days. And while the acute episode passed relatively quickly, as I continued to travel, it became clear that it was evolving into a more chronic issue. And I actually had to cut my trip short uh, and return back to the US and, and start to seek help. And it, that turned into a decade-long process of recovering my health. And at some point along the way, 
maybe about uh, two thirds of the way through, I discovered a, a paleo approach, or I didn't know it as a paleo diet at that time, uh, but it but it essentially was. I had stumbled upon it almost by accident, and that was a big turning point for me in my in my journey back to health. And and then you know together with diet tweaking my lifestyle, you know fine tuning my sleep and physical activity, stress management, etc. A lot of the things I talk about in my book. Uh, that was all collectively responsible for me regaining my health. Well, I know there are a lot of health benefits, but you know, in the subtitle of your book, you mentioned weight loss, and Michelle, you just mentioned how your husband got a six pack. And as much as we would all like to be healthy, I think that the impetus for going on a diet is very often that we want to lose weight. So, is this a diet for people who? need to drop some pounds pretty quickly because they've got an event coming up and they want to look good. I think it can be used that way, although I really caution people against using the term diet when it applies to paleo because I like people to think of it much more as a just a way of life, a way of eating, an approach to nutrition <clears throat> because that's really what it is, and also we know that people don't stick with diets over the long term. There, there's just a psychological problem with the concept of being on a diet, and we know that it's not very sustainable for most people. So I'm constantly encouraging people to um, maybe not be as rigid as, as, as some others advocate and, and make it a little more flexible and adaptable so that they can stick with it instead of doing this yo-yo cycle of extreme strict diet and then completely falling off the wagon and eating you know, cheese doodles and drinking big gulps for weeks and then going back on another strict diet and then falling off the wagon. But uh, for people who want to lose weight, it's absolutely a great choice. In fact, I think it's probably the best choice because um, when you eat paleo, you feel more satisfied than with other diets like Mediterranean or low fat and that's actually been proven scientifically it's it's more satiating per calorie which is just a fancy way of saying that you feel more full when you eat paleo foods and that then leads to naturally reducing your calorie intake and that's the holy grail when it comes to weight loss because we know that when people purposely restrict calories you know they count calories and follow calorie restricted diets up to two-thirds of them not only gain back all the weight they lost initially, they actually gain more weight back than they, than they lost. So with paleo, you don't have to count calories. You get to eat really delicious, nourishing foods that a lot of people, like Michelle was saying, think are, are going to kill you and have excluded from their diets for a long time. And you naturally uh, eat less, and then you just kind of watch the pounds fall away. So I have patients... I just got back from a month-long book tour. I know Michelle was out on the road too, but I had people coming up to me and telling me they've lost 125, 150 pounds even on this diet. They showed me pictures of their driver's license, you know, from before, and you could hardly even recognize the person that was standing in front of me. So um, you often see claims of diets where you can lose 10 pounds in 10 days, and, and that actually is very possible with paleo, and it's completely safe. So I'm going to just jump in because for me personally, I haven't lost weight. If anything, I think I've probably gained some weight, but my body composition has totally changed. Um, like I used to always have a muffin top, no matter like how much cardio I did and how much like calories I restricted, I would have this muffin top and I'd have these skinny limbs and but now that muffin top is gone of course you can't see that and I purposely made it so that you can't see that <laughs> but <laughs> my muffin top is gone um, I'm stronger my clothes fit better so for me it wasn't so much weight loss as just having you know better body composition and being stronger mm -hmm. which to me is more important yeah, most, most people who need to lose weight will, but not everyone does need to lose weight, and not everyone, therefore, will lose weight with paleo. So, uh, And then there, there are some ways of customizing it and tweaking it for people who um, maybe follow a basic paleo approach but find they're not losing weight as they want to, and that's one of the main reasons I wrote my book was to teach people how to, how to customize it and personalize it to meet their own particular needs. So, and so I know in your book, paleo is sort of the umbrella, but within that, it can be specialized for various health concerns. 
So can you talk about some of the health concerns that can be addressed with paleo? Wow, I mean, I would say just about, I mean, I work with patients on a daily basis, and I would say there are a few health concerns that can't be addressed with paleo uh, because we eating is, is, of course, the cornerstone of health. It's something we do every day, several times a day, and it's the main way that we get the nutrients into our body that, that help us to function properly. So, um, you know, there's no health condition that won't be affected by how we eat. But I do talk specifically about 10 conditions in my book that are particularly common in our country and that are really, um, you know, that, that paleo seems to have a strong effect on. And that's, uh, some of those would be uh, blood sugar issues like type 2 diabetes, hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia, o overweight, being overweight or obese, uh, hypothyroidism, digestive problems, skin problems, um, autoimmune disease certainly which now affects 50 million people in the US and then anxiety and depression and cognitive disorders. So all of these will typically respond really well to, to a basic paleo diet but then if you add some of the tweaks that I talk about in my book it becomes even more effective. Well, Michelle, your your book and your blog are so um, they're so joyous. I mean, they're really a celebration of food and family, and it just it, your sort of your love of both really just come through. Uh, but I'm wondering, is it difficult to to have these wonderful feasts and to have friends around and to travel and to and to have this uh, really joyous lifestyle and still stick to this? way of eating. I mean how difficult is that? Um, you know I don't I don't think it's that difficult. I mean I think as long as you have someone who helps you wash the dishes um, <laughs> then you can do it all the time. But um, I think for me it's just such a priority to you know spend time with people that I care about um, and to do it over food, <laughs> that like that that's my main hobby, and so it's not that hard. I mean, obviously there are times when, you know, I don't want to cook, um, so then we will go out and I will eat something that, um, you know, kind of fits fits in the kind of the paleo template. It might not be perfect, but you know, I think there's more to life than perfect clean food like it I mean part of why my blog is called nom nom paleo is you know the first part of it is nom nom like it has to be so delicious that you're just like nom, 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 nom. and the paleo is that it's just delicious healthy food um, but it is it is where it's a priority for me um, and so it's not that hard and again I have someone like my husband who helps clean. <laughs> and and your two young sons, do they eat paleo as well all the time? Not all the time, but most of the time. So when they're in my house, um, I control what they eat. Um, and everything in our house is stuff that everybody would eat. Um, and I would say I probably control probably 80% of what they eat because, you know, I control their breakfast, I pack their lunch. I make their dinner, um, but if they're at school or if they're, if they're at a party, I kind of let them kind of do their own thing. They don't have any life-threatening allergies, um, and they do live in the real world, so I let them kind of make their own decisions. And we did learn early on that if we were totally restrictive, that's when they would just go crazy and just stuff their faces with candy. Um, but if we said nothing, they probably wouldn't even eat the food at the party because they're having such a good time just running around and playing with their friends um, that they don't make, um, you know, they don't gorge on, you know, crazy processed food. But, you know, they are kids and there are times when they will just eat, you know, cupcakes and stuff because they want to eat it. Um, but my younger son does have issues with gluten, which I think he gets from me. Like, we both get cankosaurs and... Um, if he does eat something with gluten, he can become really, like, emotionally labile. And normally he's really even keeled. But, like, let's say he eats, like, a big plate of waffles. Like, an hour or two later, he'll have, like, a meltdown. And he never does. And so we actually say to him, hey, you know, normally 
this doesn't happen, right? And, and the thing we did differently was at breakfast, you had a big plate of waffles. And so, um, you know, we, we kind of tell him what the consequences are. And sometimes he'll say, okay, I don't feel like eating that. I'll pick something else. And other times, we're like, I'm okay with it. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think that we've... We've tried to, you know, set a good example for them, and so they know what good choices are. But you know, they're human, and I'm human, and I don't always make the best choices. Well, we have a lot more to cover, but I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer now because we have uh, a lot of people who would like to ask some questions. So, Jennifer, I'll send it to you. They do. Thank you, Karen. Um, so this portion of the chat tonight is where Chris and Michelle will answer your questions. Um, I see some of you have already started typing those in the chat box um, right underneath, underneath this video window, so you can continue to do that. We're going to pull them from there, um, and they're also going to answer some questions that you submitted ahead of time, um, and we'll try to get as many of them answered as we can. So I'll start pulling those for you guys now. Um, this is from Eric. Um, and he says, hi, Chris. My partner and I have read your paper on thyroid issues and wanted to ask some questions. <laughs> My partner has hyperthyroidism, which is discovered by the symptom of shaking hands. She also had a test showing she is not in ketosis, and her doctor encouraged her to lose weight. Could you speak a bit on hyperthyroidism and what steps to take? Sure. Well, hy hyperthyroidism is typically caused by an autoimmune disease called Graves' disease, and I'm not sure if, if Eric, if, if your wife was tested for this or not, but that's almost always the cause. And so in functional medicine, we like to address the underlying cause of a problem rather than just suppressing the symptoms. And in some cases, suppressing the symptoms are necessary. Uh, for example, in the case of hyperthyroidism, some of the symptoms can actually be life-threatening if they're not controlled, like uh, you know, increase in heart rate, for, for example. So uh, I'm not saying it's a bad idea always to suppress the symptoms, but I am saying that you also want to focus on the underlying cause, and in this case it would be autoimmune disease. So um, there are, a basic paleo approach is a great way to address uh, to, to address autoimmunity because you remove a lot of the food triggers that can provoke or exacerbate autoimmune disease. It doesn't mean that a paleo diet is going to cure autoimmune disease per se, but it in many cases will uh, at least resolve some of the symptoms and help the immune system to settle. But then there are additional modifications you can do um, for autoimmune disease, both from a dietary perspective, uh, things like eliminating night uh, eggs and nightshades for a period of time because a lot of people with autoimmune disease are sensitive to them, uh, eliminating all dairy products for a period of time for the same reason, and then there are some things you can do from a nutritional supplement perspective and lifestyle perspective to help balance and regulate the immune system as well. So things like making sure your vitamin D levels are optimal uh, because vitamin D plays an important role in, in regulating and balancing the immune system making sure your glutathione levels are optimal for the same reason, uh, making sure you're getting enough sleep and managing your stress, op optimal sun exposure because sunlight uh, produces a compound called nitric oxide in the skin that helps regulate the immune system. So there are lots of things you can do to address the immune imbalance that's, that's usually present with hyperthyroidism, and I do talk about that. There's a, a bonus chapter on, hypo, uh, on thyroid conditions in my book where I go into more detail and also a bonus chapter on autoimmune disease. Excellent. Great answer. Um, and this one is for, for both of you. Um, this is from Whole G, and they say, what would you have as your last meal um, if there were no restriction, restrictions whatsoever and it could be whatever you wanted? Oh, hmm. wow. Michelle, you better go first so I can think about that. Well, this is my last meal, right? So I would probably have it be some sort of crazy tasting menu that never ends so I wouldn't die. Um, but I think it would just, I mean, I love, I love variety. So I, I would probably pick some sort of tasting menu. And I guess if I'm going to die anyway, it can just be anything. Anything that the best chef of the moment wants to put in front of me, I will eat. 
and it should take a long, long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's such a hard question to answer. Um, I would say, uh, you know, I, I generally, I used to really like more elaborate dishes, and now I find that even when I go out to restaurants, I, I crave simpler foods, but just just extremely high quality simple food. So like a, a pasture raised steak that comes from a ranch where they dry age the beef for three weeks and they follow all the best practices in, in raising that beef and it, you can really taste it in the flavor and, and just fresh local organic uh, produce. So it's not really a particular meal but maybe how it's prepared and what goes into preparing it. and. Um, I would probably, yeah, like Michelle, I'd probably want to have a, a you know a a fifteen course meal with with little taste of all of my favorite foods and and just be very leisurely about it. <laughs> and I think that leads that leads into our next question um, very well, which you said there, Chris. Is um, this question is from Joe? How important is it to eat organic and ensure that the meat products are from free range, antibiotic, hormone free animals? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would say that if we were to look at a scale of importance, uh, on one end of the spectrum you would have, uh, you know, the standard American diet with lots of processed, refined foods, flour, sugar, industrial seed oils, etc. And on the other end, let's say we have like a paleo template type of diet with 100%, you know, grass-fed animal products and organic local produce, uh, GMO-free, etc. Um, and then in the middle we might have like a, or actually much further over to this end of the spectrum, we might have a paleo diet with some organic food, some pasture-raised meat, not all, and then over here we've got maybe a conventional, uh, a diet with conventional beef, conventional produce, but that is still all real food. So it's really a, a spectrum and I think the, the very first thing that people should do is eat real food you know so get off uh, there's this sort of junk food organic thing that goes on where like people think that if, if there's if a box of crackers or cookies is organic it's automatic free pass to eat as much as you want of it um, I would much rather see someone eating conventional pro real whole foods than a lot of organic refined processed foods so so that's the first thing uh, and if the choice is between you know spending a little bit more money on um, whole or real foods versus processed foods then that then that's always where your money should go um, but in terms of once you're eating real food how important is it to eat 100 percent organic well if you can afford it it's great um, I would really recommend it if you can't afford it, then there are things you can do to, to choose the, the products that are most important to eat organic. So for example, I think animal fats are probably important to eat organic uh, because the fat tissue is where toxins are stored. And uh, so eating pasture raised and organic animal fats is, is probably a pretty big priority. Um, I think there's a well there's a list in terms of produce the environmental working group publishes a list called the dirty dozen and the clean 15 and the dirty dozen are the 12 fruits and vegetables that are the most heavily sprayed and therefore the most important to eat organic and the clean 15 are the opposite they're the ones that are least heavily sprayed and if you have to choose non-organic varieties there's not going to be a tremendous difference between the two in terms of pesticide exposure so um, you can kind of choose your battles and uh, if budget's an issue and just focus on the, the things that are most important to eat organic and, and pasture raise and then you know do the best you can with other varieties. With meat I think that the most important thing to pay attention to even if it's not organic is that it, it would it, try to get it antibiotic free um, because antibiotics in meat are contributing to the emergence of uh, drug-resistant bacteria, these superbugs that we've all heard about, and I think that's actually the biggest threat to, to non-organic meat. Not hormones, but these, these antibiotics uh, that are antibiotic residues in the meat. 
Excellent. Very, very informative. Um, our next question is for you, Michelle. Um, mm -hmm. And this uh, it's from Lola. She said, you talk on your blog about umami and how fish sauce is a great way to make foods more flavorful. She said, mm -hmm. but one, is fish sauce fishy? And two, is there another way to get the same umami effect without it? And then she said, also, what is umami exactly? Okay, so umami is the fifth taste. So there is sweet, sour, bitter, and salty. And umami is just the fifth taste, which kind of means savoriness or even meatiness. But it's it's what makes food delicious, is what is what I call it. Um, and there are lots of foods that contribute umami. One of my favorite is fish sauce. Um, but um, bacon adds umami, mushrooms add umami, tomatoes add umami, um, shellfish add umami. So there are a lot of foods that add umami. So if you don't like fish sauce, you don't have to use it. But I think the beauty of umami is that you can add a little bit and it'll make your food taste so much better. And if you combine foods that have umami, it actually scientifically has been shown to like exponentially increase the amount of umami um, in your food. And there is like a institute in Japan that actually studies this. And so this is very scientific. Um, and so the reason why I love umami is because once you know which foods add umami and how you can combine them, you don't have to do that much to have your food taste delicious. Um, and I, I talk about that in the book because I think it is so important for people. And that's why a lot of delicious traditional foods start out with um, like a little bit of tomato paste or they throw in a little bit of anchovy or a little bit of bacon or fish sauce because all of these things add umami or deliciousness to your dish. Um, and so our question about whether fish sauce is fishy and the answer is yes if you use too much because anybody who cracks open a bottle of fish sauce and takes a whiff is probably like, oh, this is disgusting. This smells like, I don't know, like dirty socks. But if you just use a teeny bit and just, it, it is what makes food delicious. And so I add a little bit to everything, not just Asian dishes. Like even when I make some scrambled eggs, I will use that as my, in place of um, salt. Um, or if there's any dish that just doesn't have that kind of oomph I'm looking for, just a teeny bit, like a few drops of fish sauce will really um, just make it that much tastier. So it's like a secret weapon. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And I think, I think this question um, can be for both of you. Um, and this is from Jill, and she says, what are your top five budget-friendly shopping or kitchen tips um, for paleo? Hmm. The top five. So I think my, my top, I'm trying to think how, because being Chinese and being raised by a really good, thrifty Chinese mom, I know that I always stock up when something is on sale. And that's why on my website and on all my social media, anytime I see a good sale, I share it with everybody because I think it's important that people save money. So if there's a sale on like grass-fed meat, you stock up and get a freezer and pile it all in there um, because you can, you know, I think if anything, having a freezer full of meat is probably the thing that keeps me from going out all the time because I have this bowl in my fridge which I call my defrost bowl and all it is is it's an empty bowl that I chuck frozen meat in um, and throughout the week whatever's defrosted that's what I make and um, it, it forces me to cook the meat that I bought and it keeps me from going out so I think that's probably my number one tip and to buy eggs I think eggs eggs ground meat and a lot of brazen cuts are the best way to save money on high quality meat. Um, like oxtails and, and shanks are like my favorite cuts. So that's probably my top tip. <laughs> and, and Chris, do you have a, a top tip for, for everyone out there? Yeah, I mean, they're similar. I, I would say um, buying ingredients, not products. So buy, it's cheaper generally to buy raw ingredients and cook food yourself than to buy prepackaged stuff, you know, whether it's processed food or prepackaged meals or snacks or other items. And you can, you can generally save money that way. 
um, buying in bulk, whether you're buying in bulk yourself. Uh, for example, we buy a quarter of the cow um, for our family a couple times a year, and we have a big chest freezer in the basement, and we keep it there, and we save an enormous amount of money uh, on grass-fed meat that way. It, it comes out to being you know, far less than half the price per pound than it would be if we went and bought it in the in the supermarket. And then, of course, we have the added benefit of knowing exactly where it's coming from and supporting a local farmer that, that raises that meat. Um, getting getting ingredients that can be used in a lot of different dishes, which, which I think was in part what M Michelle was alluding to. So instead of buying a kind of ingredient exotic ingredient that you're going to use once in one dish, which of course is fun, but if you're on a budget, that, that may not be the best thing to do. It's better to buy some staples that you can use with almost all of your meals, or at least many of your meals. Uh, and then cooking in bulk is another good tip, which just means um, if you cook like a large one pot meal, for example, on a Sunday, and then you can eat that meal several times throughout the week, well, of course, you're going to end up spending a lot less money that way than if you're cooking every single meal that, that you eat um, each time that you eat. So, so there, those are just a few of, of, of the best ways to, to save money, I think, if you're doing this kind of approach. I think we, we probably have time for one or two more, so I want to make sure I grab some of the questions that were submitted for you guys ahead of time when people RSVP for the event. Um, the, the first of those says, I've been eating paleo for just a couple weeks now, and I love it but I still have cravings for grain, especially bread for sandwiches. Do you still crave bread, um, and do you recommend a good substitute, or does the craving just go away after a while? Want to take that, Michelle? Well, I, I'm smiling because I know exactly how she feels, because I love, I love bread, and I love pasta, and I used to go and have pasta tasting menus. Um, and so I can understand, like, I think it, it took more than just a couple weeks to kind of get that, like, craving out of my system. Um, and, I, and I had those cravings really bad. <laughs> but I think now I just don't, I don't really have them anymore. Um, and case in point is we just went out to dinner this weekend, and there was this, there was this dish that came by that would have totally... It had been my favorite dish just a few years ago, and it was like this crispy, puffy garlic bread with burrata. Um, and it just didn't have that pull, because before there would be like bread on the table, and I'd always just want it right away, but I just didn't feel like it. And I knew that if I ate it, I probably wouldn't feel great, and I'd get like a canker sore and, you know, GI stuff that I don't really like anymore. Um, and so I just concentrated on the short rib dish, which was right next to it, which was just as delicious and much more satisfying. Um, so I think you just have to give yourself some time. I really do think that 30 days is not just some made-up number. Like, it really does take a month to kind of get over, um, you know, cravings for certain things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe even longer. I mean, the cravings will definitely be significantly lower by a month, but in some cases if you've been eating bread and you love bread and you've had it for years, it may take a while before you're just completely free of, of the craving. Myself, I don't have, I'm not gluten intolerant actually, and I will occasionally have a piece of bread at a restaurant or something because I do like it um, and I like the novelty of that, but I, I don't, uh, like Michelle, I used to really, really like bread. In fact, I used to bake my, myself and, and be pretty Yeah, me day. too. <laughs> I sold, so, like, as an evangelist for paleo now, right. I an evangelist for bread machines, and all my friends and family all got a bread machine because of me. And then, <laughs> and then when I went paleo, they're like, what do I do with this? Right. So, yeah, I mean, I, I will occasionally have a piece um, just to satisfy that, that craving, but more often than not, whenever I do, I'm like, huh. Oh. I could take it or leave it. This isn't so great, and I just even might even stop halfway through after a few bites. So it doesn't have a hold on me anymore, and I think it probably won't for for you either. So if you just give it a little bit more time, it sounds like you're doing great so far. Um, but just give it a couple more weeks, and I, I don't. I think you'll find lots of alternatives to to sandwiches. Michelle, though, I know you 
what do you think? Of, what do you recommend for people in terms of sandwiches and and how to replace the the bread if they want to enjoy a sandwich? Well, there's lots of you know you can do lettuce wraps. I roast portobello mushrooms and I use that as hamburger buns. Um, and if you Google paleo bread recipes, you can find a ton <laughs> that are grain free. They're not quite the same as real bread. Um, but there are some that I think kind of hit the spot for people. Um, but I think, if anything, like when I ate bread all the time, that was like my main fuel source, like at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Like I just wasn't full, and I wasn't satisfied, and I did have all this like bloating and GI distress, which I just thought was normal and baseline. But when that, when I took out, you know, bread and grains, and that all went away, like I just didn't want that feeling back. Um, and so that's why I just don't eat it anymore. I think I can sneak one more in before we run out of time. Um, what are your favorite paleo snacks to eat between meals? And that's from Stacy Zukowski. Mm -hmm. hmm. Um, for me, it's generally uh, soaked and roasted nuts of some kind, uh, beef jerky, yeah, either some we make a homemade jerky or can sometimes get it from a local charcuterie. Uh, I'll occasionally have fruit or smoothie with um, some coconut milk and perhaps greens or avocado, a little bit of banana. Um, but I, I'm not a big snacker, so I'm probably not the best person to ask. But those would probably be the, the main ones. Maybe uh, sometimes if I'm traveling, I'll take some olives, um, some raspberries, uh, some some leftover meat, um, and and some and again, like I said, some nuts. Oh, some dark chocolate too. Uh, yes, I was gonna say you're forgetting dark chocolate. Yeah, dark chocolate. So those are mine. <laughs> I think I don't snack as much as I used to because I actually did an experiment with myself recently um, because I think when I'm at home and I'm working at home like I'll just go to the pantry and I'll just start grabbing things but I think when I was at work I did this experiment where I just brought a can of sardines as my snack I mean I had my meals but then I also brought a can of sardines as my snack and I actually waited to see when I was actually hungry enough to eat that can of sardines and it never really happened I mean I like sardines and I know they're great for you but like you know, I think that was just a really good test for me that sometimes I'm just snacking to snack and not because I'm hungry. And if I eat enough at my regular meals, then I don't need to eat something in the middle. Yep. I that's, think uh, that's actually a, a secret weapon to weight loss, what Michelle just said right there. If you, if you only eat the foods that you're hungry enough to eat um, when, you know, you only eat the foods that you, you would eat when you're hungry then you, you'll probably do well with losing weight. I just saw your son seek in there, Michelle. <laughs> I know, I know. They are. They're all like, <laughs> they've been really good. Excellent. So I, I think with that, that about brings us to our, our end time for the, for the chat tonight. But I want to thank everyone who joined us, who asked your questions. Um, and I want to remind you before we let everyone go that um, both Michelle and Chris's books are available right here on this page or at booktalknation.com. Um, so for your personal paleo code and for Nom Nom Paleo, they are signing and personalizing in your name all those copies that are purchased here at Book Talk Nation. It supports independent bookstores, their local indies, um, Kepler's, and a great good place for books are fulfilling all those orders and shipping them out. Uh, those sales close tomorrow night, so you want to make sure you get them in before then and get all those delicious recipes and tips and everything else um, to elaborate more on what we talked about today. So also a big thank you to Karen, to Chris, and to Michelle. It's been great having all of you, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, thank everyone. Thank you. And have a great day.